This is actually, um, I think, one of the a really great part of the of the workshop experience was a chance to kind of take stock of what we've just been talking about. These four fabulous intellectuals next to me have the unenviable task of on their feet trying <laughs> to come up with um, some some closing about seven minutes each of closing comments about sort of reflecting on on, on the on the readings and the um, discussions, the keynotes and discussions and so forth. Um, and then we'll open it up for, for a Q&A from all of you. So uh, so I will go ahead and they're going to have seven minutes each and I'm going to time you. Um, and we're going to start with my lovely colleague, Kim Lam. Uh, Kimberly K. Lam is an associate professor of gender, sexuality, and feminist studies at Duke University, whose research fields include contemporary feminist art, uh, art, contemporary poetry, feminist theory, and 19th and 20th century US literature. Her book, Addressing the Other Woman, Textual Correspondences in Feminist Art and Writing, which came out with Manchester University Press in 2018, brings together the work of artists such as Adrian Piper, Nancy Sparrow, and Mary Kelly, and writers such as Angela Davis, Valerie Solanas, and Laura Mulvey, to argue that text and writing are crucial parts of women's art practices from the 1960s and 70s. She's currently working on two book projects. The first, tentatively titled Inheriting Letters of Exile, examines a 1980s and 90s artwork of Mona Khatoum, uh, Teresa Hak Kyung Cha, and Lorna Simpson in relationship to the reading practices um, that Guy Trace Chakravorty Spivak sets forth in Can the Subaltern Speak? Kim's second book project, tentatively titled a Sense of Arrangement analyzes the work of five poets, Barbara Guest, Susan Howe, Anne Lauterbach, Rosemary, Wald Rosemary Waldrup, and Claudia Rankine, who have s contributed substantially to the field of contemporary poetry and women's place within it. Kim is a graduate of the Whitney Independent Study Program and has published art criticism, curated exhibits of contemporary art, and written catalog essays for several contemporary artists. That's too, that's too long, but you're very sweet. Um, um, I'm really happy to be here and contribute to the round table and I just want to note that we're all in white and, and my partner said that um, we look like the chorus in Antigone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, it, the round table is kind of a chorus so uh, um, I, see the, I see the papers which were really so fabulous uh, up against the limits of the irrational masked as the rational. <laughs> Uh, I also so I also noticed a psychoanalytic idiom and a set of concerns that I think psychoanalysis addresses. I think the psychoanalytic con concept of the unconscious and its attention to the psyche's elaborate mechanisms for creating defenses, distorting perception, blocking the image of the vulnerable body from view aligns with these papers questioning of the, of, of the rational or the, the kind of the will of consciousness. In uh, Roderick Ferguson's paper, we heard about the super patriarch through uh, Tony K. Bambara's imperative to pay attention to the psychopath. Um, the psychopath is an antisocial kind of psychic genre of masculinity. Uh, one could say it's an apotheosis. That's one of Ferguson's words that I like. Uh, conflated with an unadulterated aggression and a kind of death drive. Uh, the, this psychic genre at the center of Roderick's paper is an eatable figure um, without a confrontation with the damage that he's caused, you know, without, we could say, a confrontation with his unconscious. The, the super patriarch um, produced by Friedman and Davos can't be helped. There, you know, that, that it seems clear that this figure is sort of done and cooked. But um, I really appreciated his attention to those enlisted to identify with the psychopath's project with the narcissistically invested and kind of wholly defended self that sanctioned to sort of act out the death drive and see his fictional control uh, over the death drive by destroying others. So I know narcissism is super, you know, kind of tossed around a lot all the time, but I did, I did, it did make me think of this formulation from, from Freud's um, 1914 essay on, on narcissism, which he described as a difficult labor. Um, <laughs> And he was, he, you know, he was always anxious about his work in psychoanalysis being feminized. But he said, um, he's, he's talking about the fact that um, this is, you know, the assumption that women are natural narcissists and that they symbolize narcissism's ethical deficit. And he writes, for it seems very evident that another person's narcissism 
has a great attraction for those who have renounced part of their own narcissism and are in search of object love. So uh, I think Freud is saying that the renunciation of the self as an object of, of love, of investment, which, do, which could point to forces that encourage that renunciation, social forces, um, um, trying to attach to a, lovely, a loving representation of another makes one vulnerable to becoming fascinated with um, and attached to another person's narcissism, maybe the psychopath's narcissism. So I don't think that's the whole story, but I think it gestures to the, the complexity that the papers are engaging with, and, and I would say that psychoanalysis helps to illuminate. I also think uh, working, working Through is pertinent to um, the paper by um, uh, Dat Reha and, uh, and, and Miki Van Drift, as, as they focus on complicity. Um, which could be another term for internalization, I'm not sure, but, uh, and, and its relationship to the collective. So, um, you know, this concept of working through kind of gets consistently left out when scholars and humanities draw on psychoanalytic ideas disconnected from the material conditions of the, of the clinic. Um, um, but it, it, it could be connected to rewiring the sen sensuous. Um, uh, it's, it's a central tenet of the psychoanalytic process and it's a way of, of, of identifying, connecting repressed experiences, buried feelings, unsatisfied appetites, internalized assumptions, but also drawing on the language, some of the language of, of the, of the pa other papers, holding on to frictions and tensions as they move into consciousness and, and maybe um, become less likely, we hope, to kind of govern subjectivity and write its drives un, un collectively. So uh, perhaps it's a, it's a kind of femme labor working through, um, and, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what the connection is between working through in a, in a, in a clinic, you know, with the individual patient, um, how to link that to kind of the bigger, you know, the bigger working through that, that we need, but um, this could be the kind of central challenge of bringing psychoanalysis to the political, and so it might mean going back to something like um, Freud's, some of Freud's writings on, on culture, like Totem and Tambu, is he thinks through the internalization of, of a symbolic murder as to constitute a kind of group subjectivity. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Sayak uh, Valencia's paper focused on um, necro masculinity shows us a world saturated in the enforced conflation between masculinity and the, and the death drives. Um, and, and we can think of the drives as being um, uh, connected to, but also detached from biology, which I think many of the, the papers are, are trying to think through on a number of, of different levels. And so I think thinking of, of the drives as, as writing the biology or writing the instinct uh, can be part of de-essentializing feminism, um, creating new collective subjectivities, but also refusing the feminized body as the container of displaced aggression, which femicide really illustrates. And then I'll just end by, by Starling's moving paper, Portrait of Childhood Sexual Curiosity, connects, I would say, to Freud's attention to childhood sexuality, which he's demonized for. It also connects to Melanie Klein's concept of epistophilia, this drive to know about sexuality that gets clamped down in the name of protection and parental anxiety, but shuts down learning. So I've learned this recently that this is why her interpretations were so weirdly and frankly sexual, because she wanted to encourage through child analysis, the desire to know, um, but also kind of exist in, in, in uncomfortable places of, of ambivalence, um, uh, which is, and the place of ambivalence mollifies this impulse to polarize through idealization and denunciation, which I think is what's at stake in Starling's meditations on oppositionality. Those are my thoughts, <laughs> thank you. Team, no, that was really excellent. Um, okay, so next we're going to have Amber Jamila Musser. Am I pronouncing that right? Musser, excuse me. Uh, Amber is a professor of English at the CUNY Graduate Center, and her research focuses on the intersections of race, sexuality, queer theory, and aesthetics. She also serves as a member of the Social Text Collective and a, a president of Association for the Study of Arts of the Present, whose acronym is ASAP, which I love. 
Um, she is the author of Sensational Flesh, Race, Power, and Masochism, which came out with NYU Press in 2014, and Sensual Excess, Queer Femininity and Brown Jouissance, which also came out with NYU Press in 2018. Uh, Between Shadows and Noise, Situatedness, Sensation, and the Undisciplined is forthcoming from Duke University Press in spring 2024. She has also co-edited several anthologies and special issues of journals in 2017 with Kaji Amin and Roy Perez, ASAP's special issue on queer form. In 2021 with Kyla Wazana, Tompkins, Aaron Izura, Amy Bang, Michuan Gomen, and Karma Chavez, the NYU Press volume Keywords for Gender and Sexuality Studies. And forthcoming this fall with Linda Bloom and Martha Feynman, a special issue of Signs on Care and its Complexity. Um, <laughs> I like to work with people. <laughs> um, so this was such an amazing, wonderful weekend. I feel kind of stunned. Um, and also going to be talking to you a little bit about psychoanalysis. So yay, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so my, I think what struck me in kind of hearing all of these really amazing talks that are really assessing kind of the lived experience of our now is really thinking about the, the different um, sensed and effective ways that these formations of power, right? So um, with Rod's invocation of the hyperpatriarch um, and, uh, you know, and then we have the necro masculinity, sort of all these formations that for me, I think psychoanalysis gives us language to think about them, especially since a lot of the, the call that we are um, focusing on is the relationship between the linguistic um, and the sort of the cultural and sort of these like broader things. So it's a question of scale and how we're moving between them. And for me, psychoanalysis feels like the right space to think about that kind of movement between the individual um, and the broader landscape. But I think one of the things that these papers really insistently ask us to do is to think beyond an Oedipal formation. Um, so while I think that um, these analyses are brilliant, I think we're also being asked to think what it would be to center things like care, things like horizontality. So I'm thinking here with um, Lamanda's kind of invocation of the horizontal erotic lives of children, right? And sort of thinking about what that tells us that's it is about the sexual life of, of children, but it is kind of less about a hierarchical form in which people are sort of endlessly replicating um, what they have taken in. So thinking a lot, I think I've been thinking a lot about kind of how to shift away from the psychopathic, the managerial, the empirical, the necropolitical, and sort of like how a different type of cultural set of formations might allow us to do that. Um, and I think so some of that work, I. I want us to also pay attention to the ways that that kind of ask for a non oedipal is also insistently not an ask for a single voiced um, new psychoanalysis, right? I myself, in my formation of Brown Jouissance, talk a lot about what it might mean to shift toward an orientation revolving around the mother. But I think here, what we hear in all after this weekend is really thinking about how we might really sit with many different voices all at once and many different types of theorizations of what culture can look like. Um, and I think here I'm thinking so much with the lovely implications of complicity and friction um, and just sort of thinking about what it really is to kind of, uh, and trans feminism, right, in this sort of way, of, of kind of like what it is to understand where you are speaking from and how to engage with with others. For me, that's kind of a continuation of women of color's methodologies around situatedness, right? Which is sort of, um, in some ways, I, I don't think that Sedgwick like borrowed from women of color feminism in this per se, but I liken it to the axiom of everybody is different, right? And it's that whole idea that sort of, if we don't understand that difference is the principle um, and that we come from difference because we are embodied people, and then the, the task, therefore, is how to sit with difference without eradicating it. I think that that's kind of our eth the ethical um, underpinning around um, all of, you know, again, I'll just repeat complicity and friction. I'm so good at those guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I think, um, you don't have that much time left. You have, you're okay. You don't have like that much left to say, okay. Oh. Just, I, you don't have to. You don't have to use all your time. Okay. No okay. Sorry. 
Okay. And sorry, it's time. like it's very stressful. It's like it's exciting, this is a really but hard ask. I have to say, like, because it's, it's like you don't want to leave anyone out, and then you're staring at people, and you're just like, oh god. Um, <laughs> but I think this this question also is um, this question of difference and sitting with difference. Um, I will like. The work that I'm thinking about now in relation to situatedness is about noise. And for me, that question is just sort of like how to really exist with people and not consume them. And I think one of the ways that we might also think about it is, um, and I think in ways that people have been elaborating and kind of um, moving towards diffusions of knowledge and sort of how we take them in and how we transmit that knowledge, we might also think about the difference between a tactic and a strategy. Right, and sort of like how we might listen to each other and with each other as opposed to kind of um, creating structures that we then impose on others. Um, thank you. I only had to keep four people straight and I actually already got them out of order. So it was supposed to be alphabetical. <laughs> anyway, Samina Mola, is that, is that follow up? is an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Emory University. She uses anthropological approaches to examine the intersections of law and healthcare and US interventions into sexual violence and the ways in which they're invested in and reproduce regimes of gender, race, and power. Her research focuses on the ways in which healthcare, law, and policing configure sexual violence as a social and political wound. Her first book, The Violence of Care, Rape Victims, Forensic Nurses, and Sexual Assault Examination, which came out also with New York University Press in 2014, had a big year in 2014, um, explores these tensions within the emergency room. And then in her second book, Bodies and Evidence, Race, Gender, Science, and Sexual Assault Adjudication, with New York University Press in 2021, mm -hmm. she developed a collaborative ethnographic method with Heather Kulafka. Their work together argues that while questions of justice are often left, left unresolved in the courts, the science of the courts contributes to, a collect, to collective investments in and material production of gender, sexuality, and racial hierarchy. In December 2022, Samina ended her term as the, co as the founding co-editor of Feminist Anthropology <laughs> and dusted off her hands. Uh, um, Founding a co-editor, though, that's the important to note, of Feminist Anthropology, launching the first three volumes of the official journal of the Association of Feminist Anthropology. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. And yes, it's a daunting task. And so I'm going to do my best to talk about a couple of the threads that were interesting to me. And I don't assume that everyone in the room shares my interests. So that's cool if you're like, nah. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, I, I really thought a lot about, uh, in part because like we just had a very interesting visit from um, Ana Maureen Lara, who came to talk about queer freedom, black sovereignty at Emory recently, in, in which she um, spiritual forces told her not to give a talk but to do a, a ritual, and so we all participated in in a ritual in which she was clearly the most vulnerable person in the room but it was um, not a space where we were able, able to hide in the back and hide our feelings about the talk. And so I thought about that a lot, that the pictures of scholarship that many of us inherit require the person who takes the podium to be the vulnerable person in the room. Um, and the rest of us can choose or not to, to show uh, the ways in which those talks make us vulnerable as well, right? We can raise our hands or not. And you know, watching Rod answer questions for an hour, I think the Q and A was longer than his talk. I, you know, it like really started to to like I could feel it in my body, um, and so I started to think again about the themes across the questions from the audience and what they might <laughs> reveal to us about the vulnerabilities that were perhaps being surfaced um, in those questions. And I will say I was here last year and last year was my first time at the Feminist Theory Workshop. And the turf wasn't with us in the room in the way she's been with us in the room um, in this very, very palpable way um, this time. And I think that was reflected both in the orientations of all four talks and in the very different ways that they set about kind of carving out for us the space for political possibilities. And they're very different 
sets of political possibilities, though they might be interrelated, they may speak to one another. Um, and so I don't have answers, but I have questions about the way that the different political possibilities within those talks like may have sat with us as comfortable or uncomfortable, but I'm also trained at the intersection of legal and medical anthropology, and so noted very quickly the pushback, I would say, about Bambara's notion of the psychotic, right? Um, and the many, many questions that were surfaced around that. Um, and that one really left me thinking, because I found myself going to you know, my own training as a medical anthropologist and thinking about the kind of like clinical definitions. But I thought it was very useful um, to think again about uh, the way Nat and Micah so beautifully wed their um, like deep theoretical work with their uh, experience as laborers again. And so what we get is a very rich knowledge um, that is about the way those theoretical commitments can be animated in a sense, which don't necessarily put Kant above practice, right? That was one of the conversations Micah and I had in the, in the site. And I thought again about the very different genealogies of something like um, psychosis, which might abound within black studies uh, versus trans studies, right? And our or differential orientations to the clinical and to clinical knowledge. Um, and I think maybe there is some, I don't know, I have to sit with this, some incommensurability between those traditions. Um, because I think all of us have a sense in which clinical knowledge has harmed um, and continues to harm both of these, and of course, people who straddle both communities um, in different ways. But I thought to myself, like, why should the DSM get to decide what psychosis is? Why shouldn't Bambara um, use it as a polemical form or a literary form? Because my own resistance to that, like, came from my clinical orientation to psychosis versus sociopathy and, um, you know, thinking about those things. Um, and I thought also about, you know, the way, for example, um, Moya Bailey and, um, always forget, and I shouldn't, her co-author, um, so I wrote it down today, but can I find it? Um, just say the wrong quote and then here we go. Sorry about that, see, it's a high pressure situation. Um, there it is, Isetta Mobley, um, apologies to her. Um, you know, talk about the continuous figure of disability within black studies, and they invoke drapedomania, um, which many of us know is, um, the part of the pro-slavery dogma that introduced the idea that the black desire for freedom was a psychologically aberrant mental illness, right? And I think again in the in in the kind of inversion of the figure of drapedomania and psychopathy, you actually have a, a real critique of the sort of freedom dreams um, or dreams of oppression uh, within white space, uh, kind of pushing back against the uh, the dominant uh, kind of notion of, of drapedomania. So I'm, I'm sitting with that um, because it also struck me, um, again, looking at uh, Sayek's uh, pre-reading that she'd assigned that there is a really particular orientation to the particular harm of the clinical within trans communities, right? Um, that many people, wow, um, uh, uh, have experienced and so, um, she quotes Claudia Sofia Garriga Lopez, uh, who defines trans feminism as a project that's partly about depathologizing the field of psychiatry, um, and also an epistemology that you know guides an array of trans feminist activist political practices. So, I, I think there are shared investments in depathologizing, but I think that they have come to the present through very different genealogies, and so I'd like to sit with that um, discomfort. Um, and so I was really excited when um, Lamanda Horton Stallings brought parapsychology back into the room because the critique wasn't like, oh, here is a stupid empirical, like a wrongly empirical project. It was like, here is a form of knowledge production that could be authorized, but specifically that authority is, is never granted nor those resources. Um, and it again, you know, sort of raised this question for me as to like, why can't Bambara define psychosis 
right? Why does the DSM get to, uh, to take up that space? So I'll stop there, thank you. So last, only alphabetically, Julieta Singh, the Stephanie Bennett Smith Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Richmond, grounds her work in decolonial feminisms. Her first academic book, Unthinking Mastery, Dehumanism and Decolonial Entanglements, came out with Duke University Press in 2018 and offers a theoretical touchstone for scholars and artists grappling with the politics of mastery that drive our professional, political, and personal pursuits. Also in 2018, this is like a rate busting thing here, uh, she published a second book, uh, No Archive Will Restore You with Punctum Books, an experimental meditation on the body as a plural and porous archive, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award and the CLMP Firecracker Award. In her most recent book, The Breaks, which came out with Coffee House Press in 2021, was and was dubbed the best book of the year by the New York Public Library, Book Riot, and the Seminary Co-op, Singh offers a letter to her, to her young daughter about race, inheritance, and queer mothering at the end of the world. She's currently at work on a book entitled Museum of Forgotten Returns, an experimental, sorry, not a book. A, not it's a, a film. Book, sorry, <laughs> not a book. Sorry, I in, added It's that. really great to not be working on a book. <laughs> <laughs> she is fabulously at work on a, on a film entitled Museum of Forgotten Returns, an experimental documentary collaboration with Chase Joint, about radical matriarchs, interracial alliances, and anti-colonial histories across 140 years pulled through the portal of a single house. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, you were talking, Amber, about sitting with difference, and I was sort of chuckling about sitting with difference while all being dressed the same, <laughs> um, and how that might be a metaphor for thinking about um, how Jen started us off with thinking about feminist theories and the ways in which we align and also fall apart. Um, I wanted to start by thinking about the role of the respondent, because when I called my mom, who's in central Canada and Winnipeg, to say, hey, I'm going up to Duke for the weekend, my mom was like, oh, are you giving a talk? And I was like, no, I'm not actually giving a talk. I'm, um, I'm just going to be there and then to respond for five minutes. And she was like, that's kind of weird, isn't it? And I was like, it's kind of weird, but also the best. Um, so I wanted to think about, um, for my mother and with you all, what it means to be a respondent, to just think about the sort of task here, which is quite unusual and and really particular, the Femis Theory Workshop and kind of an amazing, um, and yes, high stress, uh, high stress, high intensity, fast moving position, but to think about what it means to be among the collective, to absorb, to join, to figure out how to respond in, with, and for a room a room that we have the opportunity or have had the opportunity over the last couple of days to feel together. Um, so I want to begin by saying it's an honor. I know it's an honor for all of us to, to be here, but also to think about those, those feeling tones. Um, so I'm going to approach my response by naming some of the words and terms that really struck me in, in each of the talks and that really resonated across them. And the first is climate. Um, since uh, Nat and Micah and Lamanda and Sayak and Rod all um, asked us to think about a climate of crisis and the climate crisis and the way in which those two things can never be separated um, and, and how thinking toward our, our work, our collective work, um, our activities, together and apart from one another, we need to always be thinking about climate across at least those two resonances. Um, and of course, the climate of the room and the way that it feels and the temperature of our gathering together. Um, and I was really struck yesterday by how much um, Nat and Micah drew on complicity and thinking toward that, that term complicity, which I think um, for, for, for many of us, and I want to say us with like really big question marks and quotation marks around the us, um, but the way that for many of us that has been a very paralyzing reality, um, especially when we're thinking about climate catastrophe, like what does it mean to be complicit um, in the wholesale destruction of the planet, even though we may be um, complicit unevenly. 
And so um, part of what I wanted to, to sort of add to that conversation around complicity is I loved the like yes and of it, the very theatrical move of like yes and what do we do from within complicity, but also to remember that at its root, complicity is a, a folded togetherness and that we are folded together in that complicity. In fact, so meaning we are joined by and through our complicity, um, which is both a, a, a site of struggle, but a site of extraordinary opportunity as well. So thinking about our work um, and our orientations and our lives as folded together um, in, in those ways. Um, Rod said something um, to start us off yesterday morning about feminist errands. And I'm really, really obsessed with errands. Um, uh, m mostly because errands are the like shitty things we have to do on a daily basis to maintain uh, the structures and stabilities of our everyday lives. And so thinking toward the errand as a potentially very rigorous, not just conceptual, but practical um, undertaking of, of mundane and everyday life. What kinds of errands are we running towards what kind of lives we want to be living? And I, um, I, really, I really think that the errand has something very vital to do. Another shout out to my mom. I'm obsessed with my mom and I always write about her. But um, she is a, um, a German Jewish migrant who grew up in Ireland and she grew up saying, uh, instead of saying I'm going to, to, to run errands, she would say I'm going to do messages. And I, I want to think about messaging and language and the circulation of, of ideas and um, language worlds through the sort of everyday happenings of, of what we do in a very practical way. Um, so to think about the, the transmission of everyday life and what my, um, my, my friend and collaborator, Nathan Snaza, um, is calling tendings. Um, tendings, which is um, a, a, a complicit practice and a decolonial practice, always both things, how we tend to the everyday structures of our lives. Um, has something important to say with how we feed into capitalism and how we work against it, how we participate in extractive capitalism and how we, we stage lives in collectivities that, that refuse it. Um, and Amber, your extraordinary record of collaboration uh, was very inspiring and also had so much to do with what everybody was, was talking about, that collaboration and sort of collaborative undertakings are so so vital to, to so much of what everybody has said and I'm really invested myself in in forms of collaboration as somebody who has historically been a, a very antisocial siloed writer in a room that likes to be away from I have one minute left that likes to be away um, from everyone to thinking about more capacious um, projects of multi-community organizing and activity um, activity that that um, destabilize the siloedness of our often identity politics driven um, collectivities and to think about collectivities that are much more expansive, web-like, complicated um, and messy. And then to just give a huge shout out to Lamanda for storytelling and the forms of storytelling that she invoked. Um, I was really thinking with Sylvia Winter and Franz Fanon around how we are literally shaped by um, cognitively, physically embodied by and through the stories that we tell, the stories that are told about us, the stories that we tell about ourselves, the stories that we tell to each other. Um, and yeah, I'll stop and just say thank you so much to everybody who's given so much to us over the last couple of days.